There we are. Good morning, everybody. It's good to have everyone here. Uh, welcome to First United Methodist Church, Bristol, Tennessee. It's a time when we need to really observe our mask wearing. Um, I don't know about you all. I personally know some folks that have had the breakthrough, and that sort of scares me. So I think we need to be very, very careful at this time. Um, I don't know of any other announcements. Are there any? Well, then we will begin with the reading of the Old Testament. And before we begin, after reading the one last week, which was about David and Bathsheba, and now this one, which is really kind of dark, I have made Brandon promise me the next one I have to read will be a happy one. <laughs> this is uh, from the Common English Bible, Samuel 2, 18, 5 through 9, and then... 31, 32. The king gave orders to Joab, to Joab, Shabbai, and Ittai, for my sake, protect my boy Absalom. All the troops heard what the king ordered regarding Absalom to all the commanders. So the troops marched into the field to meet the Israelites. The battle was fought in the Ephraim forest. <clears throat> Excuse me. The army of Israel was defeated there by David's soldiers. A great slaughter of 20,000 men took place that day. The battle spread out over the entire countryside, and the forest devoured more soldiers than the sword that day. Absalom came home, or came upon, some of David's men, Absalom was riding on a mule, and the mule went under the tangled branches of a large oak tree. Absalom's head got caught in the tree. He was left hanging in midair while the mule under him kept on going. Then ten young armor bearers of Jacob surrounded Absalom, struck him and killed him. Then the Crushite arrived and said, My master, the king, listen to this good news. The Lord has vindicated you this day against the power of all who rose up against you. The king said to the Crushite, Is my boy Absalom okay? The Crushite answered, May the enemies of my master, the king, and all who rise up against him against you to hurt you end up like that young man. The king trembled. He went up to the room over the gate and cried. As he went, he said, Oh, my son Absalom, oh, my son, my son Absalom, if only I had died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Our scriptures are not all stories of, of joy and victory. Some like this are quite mixed. They are the witness of God's people to the presence of God in their lives. I want to invite us to join together in a responsive reading today, and I would invite you to stand as we share together Psalm 130. Today's reading is adapted from the New Revised Standard Version. Out of the depth I cry to you, O Lord. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. But there is forgiveness with you. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. 
O Israel, hope in the Lord. And with the Lord is great power to redeem. Amen. And I invite you to remain standing as we share together in our first hymn. If you would please turn in your hymnal to hymn selection 121, we will sing together, There's a Wideness in God's Mercy. There's a wideness in God's mercy, like the wideness of the sea. There's a kindness in God's justice, which is more than liberty. There is welcome for the sinner, and more graces for the good. There is mercy with the Savior, there is healing in his blood. For the love of God is broader than the measure of our mind, and the heart of the eternal is most wonderfully kind. If our love were but more simple, we should rest upon God's word, and our lives would be illumined by the presence of our Lord. Please be seated. I want to invite us into a time of prayer together this morning. And we will, um, I'll, I'll enter into our time of prayer, invite us into prayer, sharing the collect of the day. And following that, I'll invite us into a time of quietness and reflection. And if during that time, there is a concern or a joy that you need to lift up or that you need to name simply in your heart, I invite you to do so either silently or out loud. And after a time of quietness and reflection, I'll invite us to share together the Lord's Prayer. Friends, let us pray. Grant to us, Lord, we pray, the Spirit to think and do always those things that are right, that we who cannot exist without you may by you be enabled to live according to your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. This is clients, family.
on a camper. Demonstrator. teachers and students and administrations embarking upon new school year. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I want to share with you this morning a reading from the gospel according to John. I'll be sharing from John chapter 6, introducing the story with verse 35 and then shifting down to verse 41 through verse 51. And in reverence for gospel reading, friends, I want to invite you to stand as you are able. I'll be sharing from the Common English Bible as we shared our Old Testament reading. If you have a translation in front of you that's a little different from that, that is all right. This is not the ancient Greek. This is not an autographed manuscript of, of John's gospel. If you know where one is, I have some friends at universities who would really love to talk to you. So this morning we'll be sharing from the Common English Bible. And somewhere in between the words on your page and the words on mine, there is a word that God will speak to us together. A reading from John. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. The Jewish opposition grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They asked, isn't this Jesus, Joseph's son, whose mother and father we know? How can you say, I have come from heaven? Jesus responded, don't grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless they are drawn to me by the father who sent me and I will raise them up at the last day. It's written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has listened to the Father and learned from the Father comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who comes from God. He has seen the Father. I assure you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that whoever eats from it will never die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. 
Friends, hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. I invite you to be seated. Let the words of my mouth and meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Did y'all have breakfast this morning? Anyone here not have breakfast this morning? Good. That's the right answer. How many of y'all had bread for breakfast? That was your breakfast. Piece of bread. A loaf of bread. We got this is a handful. That's all right. Usually we stick. I I I tend to stick with uh with a bowl of Greek yogurt and granola. That's my go-to. It's good. It has stick to itiveness. Oatmeal is really fun too. But some of us like a really hearty breakfast with biscuits and sausage, gravy and fried eggs and bacon. Mm, you feel that the rest of the day. We have, a, in our culture, a pretty varied palate, a pretty wide experience of, of food. Now, when you live in the desert region of the ancient Near East, under the thumb of the most powerful empire the world has ever seen, you know, constantly kept in poverty by the temple elite who profit off your paucity, how do you feed your family? Well, you lock your calories in bread. All your calories, all your nutrients, right there in this neat little package. Now, other cultures learn to lock their calories in beer, but that's another story for another day. See, we don't think of bread as especially fundamental today, particularly in our culture, especially in the middle and, and wealthy classes, we've found ways to avoid bread. We've discovered rice and its flexibility, beans, a treasure trove of gluten-free options. But, you know, processed wheat, a little bit of water and oil is still one of the cheapest easiest means of nourishing the human body. I am the bread of life, Jesus says. I am the simplest, most inexpensive way you can have depth, meaning, and fulfillment in life. Simplest, most inexpensive, most deeply satisfying, just the best in every way. So, it's a little weird that we humans should try to find satisfaction in food and sex and chemicals, relationships, cash, stuff, all that. And sure, my, my deeply incarnational theology that understands that God is present with us everywhere, that God is present in all things. That theology says the divine is in, in all of that, but none of that, not one single thing, encompasses the divine. The creator of the cosmos drafted all of this out of God's self, but only the entirety of God encompasses the reality of God. Nothing else satisfies. Not even Snickers. So oh, I have a hard time passing up a $1 Snickers at the checkout line. Uh, Snickers doggone is not the bread of life. Snickers will not satisfy. Satisfaction also isn't the bottom line. It is the disciples. Oh, us. This one fact that most of us don't want to admit. Satisfaction does not free us from pain. 
following Jesus does not release us from suffering. In fact, our New Testament authors will pretty consistently witness to the idea that following Jesus will indubitably involve suffering. That will not be popular to say. And it will not make a Joel Osteen or a Creflo dollar out of me. But we really need to be clear about this, y'all. We who take up our cross and follow Christ will endure no less hardship and grief and persecution than anyone else. In fact, because the teachings of Jesus so consistently fly in the face of the, the greedy, power-hungry, gluttonous teachings of everybody who wants to look out for themselves first, we're very likely to undergo a lot more ostracizing and pain than other folks will. Great. Sign me up. Why do it then? Why follow Jesus? I mean, if we're doing it for eternal glory, frankly, we're doing it wrong. In fact, we're probably, in that case, looking so far ahead that we're neglecting a lot of the teachings of Jesus if we're focused on those heavenly gates. Remember, Jesus leaves the heavenly gates specifically to spend time with us. Our focus should not be skyward, but outward. Our focus should be on the people Jesus calls us to love on. That's why it's so scandalous to follow Jesus. The look out for number one world can't comprehend a life that looks out for our neighbor. It looks at us with, with scorn and, and reproach because we advocate for each other and for policies and for practices that protect the most vulnerable among us because across the whole witness of Scripture, we find that our God is always on the side of the oppressed. And therefore, God Expect us who are privileged, who are comfortable, who are possessed of power to whatever degree to use what we have also to be on the side of persons who are oppressed or vulnerable or at risk. The bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. So let me do what I can to be clear. God is not calling us to throw money at people in their most vulnerable, dark times. God is not calling us to spit out platitudes at them. God is not calling us to scold them for not working hard enough. God, who becomes flesh, who exits glory to live in human pain and be tortured and inhumanely executed as though any execution is humane, expects us to do nothing short of giving up everything, not just to lift up persons out of their most dire, dark situations, but to be deeply and wholly with them in the depth desperation. Now, I'm not good at that. I'm not even good at making the effort. The dark places are ugly and they're scary and I don't want to be there. I have enough of them within myself. I have no desire to spend time in somebody else's dark place. But what I want 
is not the point, is it? It's not about me. I cannot prioritize myself and my comfort above anybody, anybody else. That kind of mindset is exactly why we are still losing friends and loved ones to COVID-19. My comfort and my personal freedom is more important than protecting the health of everyone else around me. This is why Tennessee is 48th in the nation in vaccinations. This is why one in 535 Tennesseans has died from COVID-19. The libertarian conspiracy mongering approach to COVID-19 is tantamount to mass murder. We're veering off topic. I'm more than a little frustrated about this right now. The point is this. Following Jesus means being with people in their darkness, in grief, in their desperation. Sometimes, maybe, we'll be able to bring some degree of healing. Maybe. Sometimes, the best we can offer is company. But, you know, that's more than David got, isn't it? What we're hearing today is David's darkest hour. It's a massive victory for his army, for his dynasty, but it's, it's a victory against his own son. Maybe that's a part of why he doesn't lead the army. He can't bring death to his own child. So he stays home. And he waits. Hoping against all hope that somehow Absalom survives this day. But this is the moment in which all David's missteps and power hoarding culminates. Those are the in-between stories that we've skipped over, of course, which makes it seem like this moment comes out of nowhere, but David sees it coming from a long way off. David's world has been darkening for a long time. And in the end, no one is with him. All Israel celebrates the victory of David's forces against his rebellious son, Absalom. And David, powerless to prevent the death of his own son, is robbed even of the opportunity to mourn. His chief military officer, Joab, comes to him and proclaims, Today, you have humiliated all your servants who have saved your life today, not to mention the lives of your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your, your secondary wives. By loving those who hate you and hating those who love you. Today, you have announced that the commanders and their soldiers were nothing to you. Because I know that if Absalom were alive today and the rest of us dead, that would be perfectly fine with you. Now get up. Go and encourage your followers. I swear to the Lord that if you don't go out there, not one man will stick with you tonight. And that will be more trouble for you than all the trouble you faced from your youth until now. So, the king went and sat down in the city gates. All the troops were told that the king was sitting in the gate, so they came before the king. This is a story about poor leadership. 
parts of a story about grief cut short. This is a story about how not to handle ourselves or those we love in their darkest hour. No healing will come of this. None. The bread of life does not leave us empty. The bread of life doesn't leave us abandoned. The bread of life sticks with us. The bread of life heals us from the inside out. The bread of life gives us the endurance to journey all the way through our darkest, most desperate times. The bread of life will bring us transformed into a new place, a new normal, a different way of living. O Israel, the psalmist says, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love and great power to redeem. It is the Lord who will redeem Israel from all its iniquities. I am not going to offer you platitudes or advice about how to get through your dark hours or help anyone else through them. All that I can suggest is that you be there and be aware that Jesus, the bread of life, is always there with you. And frankly, Jesus is more than enough. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you would please take your hymnal and turn to hymn selection 399. We will stand as we sing, Take My Life and Let It Be. Take my life and let it be consecrated lord to thee take my moments and my days let them flow in ceaseless praise take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my King. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from thee. Take my silver and my gold, not a might would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose. Take my will and make it thine. It shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own, 
it shall be thy royal throne. Take my love, my Lord, I pour at thy feet its treasure store. Take myself and I will be ever only all for thee. Let's go from here. God's going to be with you wherever you go. The bread of life will never abandon you, will never stop filling you up. Open yourselves to a keen awareness that God is with you and share that good news in your words and simply in your presence with the dark, hurting people around you in whatever situations each of you finds yourself. Go in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.